characters. By now you should know that when it comes to a show, the characters need to be really good. And when it comes to the show of Ruby, the characters have been often highly praised. For the most part. Even the relationship and kinship shown so far have been wonderfully built up. Not that you haven't tried to destroy some of them. What exactly do you have against insects and flowers, pollination hater? And with the introduction of several new characters into the show, with this past season of Volume 4, we have gotten some more great ones. But as previous volumes have shown us, not every character is hunky-dory. In fact, some of them have been pretty bad, either through poor representation or poor development. And today, we're going to look at some of the worst, along with some of the best. Here are the top and bottom five characters of Ruby Volume 4. Starting with the worst so that we can end this on a positive note. And the first one that we're going to talk about would be, of course... Number 5. Oscar Pine. I'm guessing that this is going to just continue to be a trend in the show where we just keep asking, wait, who the hell are you? Oh, that's right. Even though we did get a fair amount of screen time with the kid, and even going so far as to pair him with a already known and loved character, we still didn't care that much about him. His scenes is the second scenes that we get in the beginning of the season, and he continues to play an important role as a new protagonist. But they cut out all but the key moments of his growth. And I don't mean that they meticulously chose just the right scenes so we don't get any pointless moments with him. No, I mean they went at his character with a meat cleaver and literally took out all but a handful of key development scenes. And while some characters may be able to stand on their own with just a few appearances a season, a handful of scenes make a protagonist they do not. And apart from not getting an appropriate amount of screen time, the portrayal of him wasn't done well either. And that's not to say that he wasn't voiced properly, because Aaron Desmute is a really well-known voice actor and has done some fantastic work in the past, as well as doing a great job with Oscar. It was the lack of guidance with the structure of his scenes. Without any prior knowledge to what Ospin's past was or what he was tasked to do, the audience can't get behind Oscar. True, this could have been a moment that hints to the future with what was said between the two, but with stereotypical cliched lines, we don't get that. Which is why he's on this list, but only at number 5, because the conversations between these two were indeed mildly enjoyable, and again, Alphonse is great at bringing out that childlike, unsured, scared tone to his words. But as an attempt to introduce a new character, the dynamic doofus has failed. It was meant to get us ready for another protagonist, but not knowing who he is, it failed. It was meant to show us the plight that he was under, but not understanding what peril lay ahead, it failed. It was meant to give us another connection to the past, but with Ozpin so closed lip about it, it failed. So much failure from so much potential. It's like your average video from Noble. Well, it might be a pine in the butt to say, Oscar just didn't have enough soul for his scenes. Number 4. Jock and Whitley Schnee. Yes, it's a bundled group, but I've done them in the past, and that's because that some of them technically can be treated like a single entity, as they do act like one. And don't tell me that you're upset on seeing them on this list, you liars. Cause let's face it, these two were pretty much indistinguishable. I mean, both were more or less there just to reestablish that Weiss's life at home sucked. As if we couldn't figure that out with her Ruby not being there. Now, they were entertaining in the aspect that they were the few villains that actually had a viable presence, but they had no other aspect to their character besides that. And with so little screen time, it was hard to see them as anything more than a foreign entity rather than the family connection that they needed to be to forge a better emotional moment. As family that once might have cared for her, it would have presented a greater emotional struggle for Weiss to overcome. However, Jacques might have been an imposing figure, as well as terrifying at times, but very little resolution comes from it, as Weiss neither confronts him, nor does she confront the emotional dilemma of what her own father is doing to her. She just ditches him like she's a moody teenager. Oh. Whitley was worse, as he could have been the old ally turned traitor, as he too befell their father's fury. However, he was just made out to be another Jacques, and we already had a Jacques, and we didn't need another Jacques the cock. And this all culminated with Weiss's decision to leave, but its impact was dampened as there was nothing that even remotely held her back. Perhaps an argument could be made for Klein and Weiss's mother, but Klein was barely given enough development for the audience to truly become attached to. And Mrs. Schnee wasn't even shown in the volume, besides a single portrait. 
so the viewer had no reason to believe that this was truly a difficult decision. Which again, sort of undercuts the villainy of these two imposing forces. It reduces what could have been an emotionally complex decision into a simple scene of two jerks picking on our girl. And I know some of this might seem a little nitpicky and petty, but A, these two were built up to be a tough thing for Wise to deal with, and B, It's foolish not to do as father asks. Ah! So quit your complaining. Anyways, they were so close to being viable, emotionally driven villains, only to end up as nothing more than crooked capitalists. I guess Cock and Shitly were pretty much just that. Number 3 Yang Zhao Long Ricardo the Cynical Critic, you have been brought before us to answer for your crimes against waifus. How do you plead? Wait, what? The, the hell is that supposed to mean? Did you not put Yang Zhao Long on a list claiming to be the worst characters of Ruby? That was just for this volume. I put her on the best for one and two. You are being judged for current crimes. And for such a vile act, it is only fair that you suffer an equally cruel fate. No. 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 You're not my senpai. No. Shut up, stupid! Well, I've got nothing left to live for. See you assholes in hell! Bye, dumbass! explain why she's on the list. In all honesty, to be on a list like this, you don't necessarily have to be a bad character. The three main reasons anyone would be placed on a top worst characters list are either because they had a poor voice actor behind them, poor writing and development, or failed in some way to meet the expectations set for them as a character. And Ruby so far really hasn't had any bad voice actors. It looks like we're going to have to do it the hard way. Yang? Is that you? What are you for the most part at least. And a lot of the failures in the characters have been with the villains, as you'll see coming soon. And Yang is still a pretty fun character, so it must be the second when it comes to her. Within the quarter portion of two different videos, she went from terrified of the memories of what happened to her to back on her feet like nothing was ever wrong. Her development was not simply rushed, it was on next day shipping before Amazon could even put it in the box. It was like Miles and Carrie were trying to cut as many corners as possible, so they just grabbed a power sander and rounded everything off like they were an igmophobe in a Red Angles factory. And it's not just her recovery, but the overall feel to the character we knew and loved has been toned down. Even with the undercut of her screen time, it wouldn't have mattered if we could enjoy the moments that we did get with her. Previously, she was the life and soul of this show, and we don't expect her to remain the same after what happened, but we needed some form of consistent emotion from Yang. And the dynamic doofuses didn't just fail once, but twice, as they could have focused on her growth while she was training, but they didn't. And that's why she's on this list. Not because she was a poor character, not because she was poorly voiced, and not even because she was poorly limited in screen time, but because her development was so poor, homeless veterans were donating to her cause. Too bad Miles and Carrie were a little disarmed in handling making sure that Yang's healing was done just right. Number 2 The Hand of Salem. Now, technically, they're not referred to as that, and yes, it is another bundled group, but I needed a way to complain about these idiots, and I am trying to make a pattern here, okay? Don't know if you can see that yet. Plus, you gotta admit, that name does sound pretty cool. It's the only cool thing about them, but yeah. Now, the reason that anyone would be on a list like this, and yes, like with a fight thing, I'm including groups that act like a single entity. Like I said, it's because they in some way failed to meet their expectations, which can be a variety of factors, to personality, to interactions, to their presentation, to the voice actor's influence on the character, or in this case, because of their lack of presence, as they were neither a threat nor intimidating towards our protagonist. Apart from a mild side quest that we forgot about before and after it started, none of our villains presented a viable threat. And apart from Cinder, none of them really cared about the rescue park rangers. And worse, 
It's not a new issue. From day one, Ruby has had a hard time presenting the bad guys as direct threats to our main characters. Only Roman had any relevance, and that was only because of those meddling kids and their damn dog butting their noses in and ruining his father-daughter time with Neo. But with both apps in this volume, it was up to these five to prove that they had what it took to be the intimidating shadow that would befall upon our girls. But apart from a cameo or two and a Mission failed! We'll get them next time! All disappeared from the story after being introduced. Again, this was the same problem Roman had in Volume 1, Cinder in Volume 2, and Adam in Volume 3. It's nothing new, and it's clear that Miles and Carrie have always had this problem, and in Volume 4 it hasn't gotten any better. What's probably worse is that almost none of them seemed like a team, or even mildly aligned. At least with Cinder and her posse, they acted like a uniform whole, though each had distinct personalities. But each of the Hand of Salem failed to feel like anything more than a few random evil stereotypes. They they weren't a threat to our girls, they didn't make us feel afraid of them, and they weren't anything more but a few one-off appearances. Sorry, but I gotta hand it to Salem when she said, You disappoint me. And before we get to the worst of the worst, let's take a look at those who are just good enough not to be on this list. Jean Arc. Probably shouldn't blame the dude so much, as he did lose the only girlfriend he'll ever have in his entire life, or the next. But after a seemingly strong start to his progression as a character, that more or less came to a screeching halt after the first act of the season. I guess his character, Ark, went the way of his girlfriend. Ozpin Similar to Oscar, we really didn't know enough of the Space Wizard to get behind his dilemma with dealing with the difficulties of destiny. Luckily for him though, his voice actor Shannon can still bring out that soothing tone, so Ozzy Boy was able to ghost himself out of that one. The Wrens. Wrens, Lies, whichever last name you consider canon, it doesn't help the fact that as great as their voice actors and characters were, being only shown briefly in a single episode and never before, and likely never after, leaves the blow of their deaths dull and ineffective, making it hard to remember their sacrifice. And now for the worst character of Volume 4. Number 1. Ilya. It's cause she's a lesbian and since I don't like the bumblebee, or is it bumblebee now? I don't care, but I am a Christian so clearly I'm a homophobe. Moving on. Okay, hopefully you all know that I'm joking. Personally, I don't care. And secondly, Ilya hasn't had enough screen time to be on a list. But there has been someone who's had more than enough screen time to leer at the camera, which has done nothing to make him any more of a threatening villain. That Bing? Number 1. Tyrion Gallows. It's interesting that's his last name, as that's pretty much what has happened to his performance. His tail certainly got a visit from the Grim Reaper. Now, there are some fans of this silly psycho, and true, he is the only one of our main villains in this season to actually do do something besides pout and have some tea. However, as I said, there are three reasons that a character would be on a list like this. And his is because he failed to be the threat that he was promised. First was him being unfortunately placed as the comedic role for two out of five of his appearances. Then he tried to act scary, but with like 10 seconds to do so, it really didn't have much effect. And finally, just when we might seem to get a legitimately creepy, unhinged moment with him, we cut away. Probably because he stuck his tongue out like a moron. Sadly though, it's likely this was a lose-lose situation, as gaining his psychopathic credibility, we might have lost some good jokes in an awesome fight. I say might, because it was possible to get the best of both worlds, by placing some other character as the butt of most of the jokes, leaving Tyrion to be the terrifying figure we needed him to be. However, that didn't happen, and what makes things worse were that the times that he was betrayed, it was as a laughing clown rather than anything that would make him an unhinged hazard. As much as anime would like you to think, more often than not, a crazy laugh in small pupils doesn't lean to a scarier character. This is a trope that has been done dozens of times over because it's the go-to method to easily establish the sanity, or lack of some, in a supposed psycho. However, that's only the baseline, and as the audience desires something more substantial to get behind the threat to our characters, simply leaving it as such only works in ruining any sense of danger. 
We did start to slide over to a better version of the character during his last appearance as we both got to see more characterization from him and a nicely executed, sort of, mental breakdown. But as stated, that was the last appearance of him and while it does cause us to wish to see more of that side of him, as of now, well, any sting Tyrion might have had was sent to the gallows. But as many of you should know by now, this show is known far more for its great characters. And boy did we get some good ones this season. So let's go over the best five. Starting with... Number five. Salem. From fifth worst to fifth best, but what else would you expect from Cortana herself? Yes, how can I help you? Uh, no computer, I'm good. You need some food? Where would you like to eat? Uh, no Cortana, we are not doing this joke. I'm not interested in your bondage fetish. Not choke, joke, joke, like a bit. Fighting is not sexy, you pervert. Oh, god damn it, no, we're not doing this dead trend, besmirch missy. So bye. Sending me search history to FBI. That is not my search history. Speaking about search history, if you look up the character Salem from Ruby, you'll get to see the numerous amount of beautiful pictures created for this character. And there's a reason for that. Well, two reasons. Oh no, not him again. Hey, I might have given you that virus, but I did remove it, didn't I? Yes, you're very thoughtful, but abuse spouse jokes aside, it was easy to understand the worry behind Salem being a good villain as she was so suddenly introduced, ironically so late in the previous season. But again, Jen Taylor is showing why she is such an acclaimed actress, as while her few appearances should not have helped the fact that she did little to nothing, her presence on both the other villains and on the audience speaks louder than action. And that's what you need from a good antagonist. Presence. She could pop in every single episode and constantly try to attack our main girls, but if they don't have that ominous aura about them, then they're no more than a mild nuisance. But the way that Salem was portrayed was just right, for we feel through her millions the sense of power and strength she possesses. True, we could have used some more time with her, and it could have given us a demonstration of the depths of her abilities, but as I said, that isn't necessarily needed. Think of some of the greats, Darth Vader, Lord Ozai, Voldemort, Father, and so many more made their presence known through the imposing figure they presented far before they showed us just how much of a force they were to be reckoned with. And the same is with Salem. Though she didn't do much, Jen Taylor proved that her voice alone is enough for us to fall in love with her. Cause whichever side you take, you can't deny that the trial of Salem is going to be a tough one for our girls. Number 4 The Belladonnas Yes, another group, but like with the Schnees, each wasn't good enough to make the list themselves. However, the three did do something that no other has managed yet. Show us a good family. And I don't mean good as in not evil, but good as in a good representation and dynamic of the relationship of a family. The Schnees were another family, but not getting either of the other Schnee girls, and Jack and Whitley being practically the same person, we weren't able to explore the familiar dynamic of parent and child. But with the Belladonnas, we did get it, and it was great! Both the way they were written and how the voice actors brought them to life felt authentic and real. It felt like the actors were related and that's where we have to give it up to them. Kent Williams is probably the least surprising as he's already very well known both for his contributions as a voice actor and his past presence as a father. But that didn't stop him from showing us just how well he can play a loving, caring papa. And each time he interacts with his little kitten, both are at their very best. And while Aaron Zack might have struggled here and there, especially compared to with these titans, again she is able to bring out that conflicted soul that Blake is. And through Gira's interactions with others, we see where Blake gets her bold, determined spirit. At least until she runs again. And such meekness may in fact come from her mother, along with her loyalty. And Tara Platt again isn't as known as Williams, but that didn't stop her from blowing us away with her performance. Every single scene with her was practically perfect, both in structure and interaction. However, like with the Schnees, they were only here for a brief while, and we had no recollection of them beforehand. So number four is all they could make. But while they weren't the Belladonnas of the ball, they most certainly were the big cats when it came to family. I really don't like you. Number three, Raven Bronwyn. 
starting to see the mirrored reflection? But seriously, even though she got only one scene in the entire season, it was one of the best scenes of the season and one of the best character interactions of the show so far. Now it's easy to understand why this seems hard to believe, considering that yes, she only had one scene and then is never really spoken of after it, but once again, it's the presence of a character that really influences their standing as a character. And all things considered, it's pretty amazing how well this went down. Though it was brief, we got so much from her from so little. This is due in part to her interaction with her brother, as Vic Mignogna did a great job bringing out that familiar connection that helped drive the scene. However, as great as Vic is, he wouldn't be the reason that she's on this list. For Anna Holm really didn't work on anything to this extent before voicing Raven, but hats off to her because she freaking nailed this scene! True, she did have some time to practice from her last appearance, but the way she made Raven feel not only like a real sister arguing with her brother over who's gonna do the dishes this time, but also like she's been a character since the show started. Introducing a character so late in the show can often lead them to not fitting in with the rest of the cast or feeling out of place in the story. But somehow they managed it with Raven here. Which is why she instead of Crow is on this list, for I think it would be a more of a cheap given to place him here, whereas Raven practically went from a zero to a hero, metaphorically speaking. But even her failure as a mother is still pretty great, again not literally, but to how it carved her as a character who is fraught with compromise and fault. The atmosphere, the structure, the pacing, the interaction, all were nearly perfectly executed during this single scene. We get the feel of history like with no other in this volume from the words that she speak, hinting to more than what's going on in the story right now. So though her time with us flew by quickly, Raven is definitely a brawn win in my book. Number 2 Renora in case any of you were wondering, yes, I feel dirty every time I say any ship's name, but don't worry, I'll wash my mouth out with acid later. First, let's talk about our second romantic relationship in the show. Hopefully this one goes better than the previous one did. And like with the previous groupings, neither of these characters were good enough to be on the list by themselves, but as a group, they more than proved their worth. And while this season wasn't that great, as seeing what I had to work with to make these lists, it at least brought us some amazing moments with these two. Again, neither could make this list on their own, but that sort of mirrors their whole relationship, which was finally explored in depth. And like the one before it, it wasn't suddenly developed and then established that they were together, but slowly built over the course of the show. In the first three seasons, it was worked on behind the scenes through transition shots, throwaway lines, and humorous moments, leading up to this season which constantly came back to focus on them, and each time it gradually became more and more prominent, from subtle hints to a full-fledged episode to the season finale that solidified their relationship not with an overly cliched kiss, but with a subtle, far stronger visual representation of their love. You simply need to only look into their eyes to see what each means to the other. It's probably the best built relationship, yes I said it, of the series so far, and far better than what most of the fans can come up with. In build up, in execution, and in believability, Ren and Noor's relationship bloomed more beautifully than any Lotus in the history of the world. And now before we get to the best character of the season, let's take a look at those who were good, but not good enough. Sun Wukong Similar to Blake, Michael wasn't able to make the list itself, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't a good character. Throughout the volume, he proves time and time again, in such a believable and well-executed way, his love and loyalty for his feline friend. Though others might want to sting him again, Sun still showed them that King Kong ain't got nothing on him. Crow Bronwyn it's Vic Manana! Of course a character voiced by him is going to be good, but sadly a combination of being removed from most of the season, as well as possibly the rest of the show, and his sister practically stealing the spotlight, I couldn't rightly put him here without it feeling like I was pandering. Either way, while Crow might not have killed it this time, he still soars in my heart. Tai Yang Zhao Long Again, the dude's back on the runner-ups, but Bernie somehow shows again how great of an actor he is despite such few appearances. While that's a given for Pastor Man himself, it was wonderful to see another great father in the series. So while Daddy of the Year's appearance wasn't very 
long, Tai Yang certainly zowed us with his performance. And the best character, the one with the most growth, presence, and emotional impact was... Number 1. Cinder Falls. I know this isn't a popular choice, and you guys are still butthurt by what she did, and I have my own biases, so clearly I'm right, but go ahead and write your own hate comments anyway. It doesn't matter, she didn't even make the list! Nope, it's actually someone some of you think is even less popular! Number 1. Ruby Rose. Suck it all you Ruby haters! But yes, she is clearly the best throughout the entire season, let alone the show itself, because how she was slowly developed, not into the protagonist that we sort of wanted, but the protagonist that we needed. Not becoming a hero because Destiny has proclaimed that she must, but because she wants to protect those that she loves. And that's pretty much always been what Ruby's done. Whether it be stopping a robbery, weapon smuggling, a train heist, Project Insight, or the breaking up of another team, she never needed to intervene, as none truly or immediately impacted her. But like a real hero, she stood up against evil, not for fame or personal gain, but because it was the right thing to do. And this volume was her first stride into fully accepting that role as seen with her slow progression from recovery to her letter of declaration against the hopelessness and helplessness that weighed on her and her sister, momentarily claiming the latter. But Ruby would not and did not give up, not when her friends needed her so. And how the dynamic doofuses showed Ruby's progression was executed brilliantly. Starting with another short of her determination that was tested time and 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 time again. But she pressed on still, even when it was hard, even when things went from bad to worse, even though the dangers were severe. She never gave in. And through her facial expressions, through her quiet reflection, through her timid words, this little rose has bloomed so beautifully. Once again, the last scene with her is all that is needed to finalize just how much she has grown. While she's still not what we would expect a normal protagonist to be, as a character, she is more than what we could have expected from someone who barely got much personal focus in the first two seasons. However, what began in Season 3 is now starting to pay off. Ruby has risen to be one of the more driven characters, again not by the plot or writers, but by her own choice to be, as her sister once put it, like the heroes of old. The heroes who were willing to give their lives for others to see a better tomorrow. So indeed, while it took a while for this rose to grow, and though many wish to see her reduced to cinders, Ruby still stands like a lone flower in the devastated battlefield that is the remnants of this world. And there you have them, the best and worst characters of Ruby Volume 4. Which character or pairings were your favorites? And which ones didn't you really like or you thought needed some more work? Leave a comment in the section below, I'd really love to hear them. If you want to see more of these videos, hit subscribe and don't forget to hit the bell icon because otherwise YouTube won't notify you. I'm Ricardo, the Cynical Critic. With me, no movie sacred, no video saved, but all deserve a chance. I'll catch you guys next time. Toodles!